honest with you, Tig and I decided to just completely not address Thanksgiving as part of our teaching tonight and to just stick with the teachings as they are. Um, and before we move ahead in that, I just do want to really name and honor that this is a hard time of year for some of us and that this is a hard time of year for some of us every year and a hard time of a year, hard time, especially this year. Um, many of us have various degrees of loss and uncertainty and just so grateful we can be together. Really, really grateful we can be together in community and adhering ourselves to these teachings, much of which tonight point us towards really finding this inner sense of what serves us. So that's my aspiration. And we will be doing a bit of sharing this evening, not small groups for those people who are always terrified when even the idea of small groups come up. Exhale, you don't need to leave early, but we really are interested in engaging in discussion. And as such, as a Sangha, I wanna remind us of you know, our core ethic of doing no harm, of being together in this space and really being thoughtful and applying our mindfulness to body, speech, and mind and that doing no harm. So that when we are asked to respond and maybe you hear other people or you even think about what you say and then have immediate feeling of regret or worry, just to really be kind, to be present and to as much as possible feel as though your ears were ears of compassion in the listening and that your fingers typing are fingers typing of compassion and that you are really enacting and embodying that quality of care, kindness, and openness. So that's my aspiration. And, you know, really recognizing we are all coming here from so many different life experiences in this moment and in general. And someone may share or say something that just sounds um, unfamiliar and to be open with that. Also really want to emphasize how important it is for this to feel like a space that is as much as possible, one where you can feel safe and at ease. And that if anything arises in the course of this evening that in any way kind of constricts that, uh, we would be so grateful if you found a way to let us know. I know it's hard to reach out and directly email and say, this didn't work, or this, but we really, um, it's so important to us and we would just love that feedback. Um, if we inadvertently, um, create any kind of harm in the format and the teachings or in the way we move ahead. So with that epic preamble, thank you all. Hopefully you've gotten really comfy on your cushion. We are going to move into our first practice for the night. And as we've been doing through the course of these teachings, a lot of the skills and tools of these Lojong slogans are in our procedural knowledge not the descriptive or declarative knowledge of here's the slogan, here's how we think about it, but in that application. And some of the skills and qualities that are most important are creating a steady and spacious mind. And also cultivating this buoyant heart. So the first practice will be working on the first of those qualities, this steady and spacious mind. There are so many ways to talk about this practice of taking the mind and whatever arises within it as our object of practice. I want to remind us of one way that we can think about this. It's almost as though we are practicing noticing the thoughts and images as we would be noticing in a dream that we were dreaming. So I don't know about the rest of you all, but I feel as though these last couple of weeks leading up to this holiday, there's been even more agitation. Uh, there's been more things for my mind to grasp to, a real sense of linearity, this thing and the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And it, <clears throat> it can become a feeling of real density. I have no way out of just that proliferation of different thoughts, ideas, and I have very little time during the day to actually experience the spaciousness of mind. And in this practice, what we're working towards is maintaining a spaciousness. So that throughout the day, even amid all of these thoughts, all of the motion of what is coming and going in our everyday mental environment, we maintain and sustain this spaciousness. 
it's almost as though we are completely at home and nothing can anchor us out of that. So even if we get pulled this way or that way with anxiety or jealousy or fear, we're rooted in the very depth of our awareness, which is a place naturally of openness, of clarity, even bliss. So in this practice, I really, I really invite you to you know, think about and take on that this practice could be one that leads you into your evening. So we start here practicing together and we will essentially fall back and notice the thoughts, the memories, the images, the contents of the mind and we'll rest in that spacious awareness. And we could take that all the way into our sleep as we're falling asleep and we fall into the dream state. Can we notice even in the dream state the way that these thoughts and memories and images arise and they seem so real, they seem so solid but we're just dreaming. Can we bring that same sense of dreamlike quality of thoughts into this practice? Really recognizing them as just passing illusory phenomena. So that's our invitation. So to get started, please find a comfortable position. One in which you can really have a sense of being supported by a cushion or chair or bed beneath you. For many of us, having a little bit of a lift behind the buttocks is helpful, giving the spine a bit more uprightness. And giving yourself a moment to really decide and choose the placement of the hands. You can place them gently on top of the thighs. You can fold them in the lap. Wherever you decide to place the hands, have a real sense of settling in. Invite the belly to be spacious, free, unencumbered by constriction. And feel the spine and its uprightness. A gentle dip of the chin and eyes softly closed if that feels safe and comfortable. Otherwise, open and just gently focusing in front of you. Some of you have already moved the screen, so it's just facing you sideways. Feel free to do that. You can have a spacious place for your eyes to rest if they are open. Invite a softness through the forehead and the brows. A gentleness through the eyes. Invite the jaw to melt, soften, and completely release any tension. while allowing this softness and this gentleness to permeate the field of the body, invite a vividness and awakeness through the inhale. And 
Exhale, gently release. Inhale, vividly notice the sensations of breath traveling in. The closer we attend to the breath, the easier for it to settle our speech, our need to communicate. Notice each moment when the mind leaves a breath. And gently return and refresh the interest. Drawing in vividness through the inhale and relaxing and releasing through the exhale. And to support the focus and stability of the mind, we'll engage with a simple practice of counting. At the very top of the inhale, just before the exhale, you can begin your counting silently and to yourself, one. And moving upwards towards 10. Every time that you lose the focus on counting, you start over without any sense of regret or failure, just to refresh and refine this practice of attending closely. Throughout the inhale, we notice the inhale. And we gently punctuate the breath with the number and then notice the exhale throughout the exhale. It is not a practice of mindfulness of counting. It is still a mindfulness of breathing using the simple anchor of one to 10.
It doesn't matter how many times you start over. Each time you refresh your interest, attending closely to the breath, and anchoring this noticing by counting right at the top of the inhale, just before the exhale. A simple practice offers unbelievable benefit, creating a mind that is truly serviceable, reliable, one which can support us in the middle of the night when we awake with rumination, one which can provide us a sense of clarity when everything feels overwhelming either with anxiety or fear or anger. Consider an intention for your practice this evening. For what do you want to make this mind serviceable? And then gently coming back to the breath without counting for just a couple more moments of fully attending closely to the inhale and exhale. Noticing what it feels like as the entire body is breathing. And shifting to having our object of attention no longer be the breath and the breathing body, but the mind and the contents of the mind. We softly open our eyes without focusing on anywhere in particular. And engage in the simple yet profoundly difficult task of not grasping. Allowing whatever enters the mind to simply enter the mind and leave. as though we were a hawk in the wind. Thoughts streaming by on every side, above and below, but our awareness maintains a steadiness, a stillness in the motion. We are not carried away.
softening the gaze, brightening the mind. Feel or imagine that this space of mind has no boundary, can hold all of the activity and agitation that wants to come through without getting obscured, without getting blocked. Fluidly moving thoughts, memories, images, all the contents of the mind. In this moment, our awareness is here in the present. All these thoughts, memories, and images are like a dream. Gently closing the eyes, regathering your attention and awareness into the field of the body. And gently noticing the breath.
Thank you all for your practice. Before we dig into this next slogan, any questions on that practice, settling the mind in its natural state? Very simple, sometimes not so easy. If a question arises, we are happy to hear it in the chat or raising your hand. Otherwise, I will hand it off to Tig. Thank you, Eve. Grateful for you. <laughs> uh, interesting to do a practice of settling the mind in its natural state, uh, just as you begin teaching. So uh, something that I'd like to recommend doing, something a practice similar to that any time that you're about to engage in a conversation or a presentation maybe, and just see how the mind is flooded with all of these thoughts, even more so than when we just sit for practice in the morning, as we prepare to use our cognitive intellect, noticing as a practice what's happening before we begin to employ that um, rich, fertile soil there to practice with. Um, so thank you all for joining us tonight. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, tonight, our slogan from the Lojong that we'll be working with, um, this, this system of mind training and developing wisdom and compassion is, um, of the two witnesses, hold the principal one. And so, uh, you know, I, I think about half the slogans are pretty understandable and the other half really need to be unpacked. <laughs> uh, I'm grateful that tonight is shorter than two weeks ago. We had quite a long one to unpack. So um, of the two witnesses hold the principal one. Um, so who are these two witnesses and which one is the principal one? So in this slogan, the reference is the two witnesses are us and the other and the principal one being us. So here we're really um, invited to explore the subjectivity of our experiences between us and the other person. A lot of times I like to think whether it's, you know, there's five people in a room, there's five different movies being played out in that room. And so this slogan is inviting us to look at there's of the two that are in a conversation or in an experience, there are two different subjective points of view. So which one do we go with? Which one is right? Which I think Eve will touch a little bit more into the aspect of that um, during her talk. Um, and so here, the analysis of this slogan is really about trust trusting our own point of view between these two witnesses of the present moment that we need to trust our experience as the principal one. Sure, there can be a trust in the other, but really it begins with our own experience. And I like this, there was a, a adaption of this slogan, trust your own eyes. But we can't trust the eyes of another to see for us. We can't trust the ears of another to hear for us. So really we can find a sense of empowerment in our own experience and cultivating that sense of trust. Um, so when I kind of think through this slogan, what comes up for me is this, this sense of na a natural intelligence that we're trusting our own natural intelligence here, which may be different from our cognitive intelligence, our thinking intelligence, but just this natural force that's flowing through us. And to illustrate this example, I'd like to give an analogy of a flower, a flower bud. And when does a flower know when to open? When does it know when the sun is up? When does it know that it's developed enough to start opening its petals? 
it's this natural intelligence that's running through the flower that allows it to open at the time that it does. And there's no brain there. There's no thought. There's no doubt. Is this the right time for me to open or should I wait another day? Is that flower next to me opened a little bit more and maybe I shouldn't open as big or I need to be, I need to smell the same way that that other flower. So there's none of that cognitive thought process there. It's just a natural intuitive intelligence of when to open. And I think, you know, it's, it's inspiring to me that we have these examples of in nature, all, you, you know, we can extend this beyond just a flower. Like how does, a fl how does water know how to flow? Uh, it, that these things all happen without cognition uh, and with very, you know, with no ego. So I think one of the things though, that it can be difficult to trust ourselves uh, because of the way that the ego gets in there and we have all these doubts and we have experiences in the past that may have made it difficult to believe in ourselves. What other people have said, what society has projected on ourselves may be difficult to trust ourselves. But here, we're not trusting ourself. As we all know in the Dharma, there is no self here. We're trusting our natural intelligence. The, um, you know, I, I think again, in the framework of the Dharma, this is our Buddha nature, our ability, our potential inside of us to know intuitively how to take care of ourselves, how to hold the principal view of our own experience. And so to help make this jump from a flower to Buddha nature into our own experience, think about a cut on the body. How does your body know how to heal that cut? There's no thought. There's no cognitive thought. Yes, we can create conditions of healing, but those thoughts are not what is healing the body. It's this natural intelligence that we all have. So bringing this example of the flower and the natural intelligence of nature into our own experience, that these are all things that are happening without cognition. And interestingly, that we open that practice with a heavy emphasis on mindfulness of our thoughts. And what I'd like you to consider here is that practice, watching our thoughts, watching our cognition as the observer, not grasping on, not following the thoughts, but simply leaning back and watching the thoughts is what creates the space for the natural intelligence to flow. Many times I find in my own experience that I start tightening when I am when I'm identifying with and getting lost in my thoughts and it's blocking that flow, that natural intelligence. I had an example about <clears throat> my creative process as an artist, but I think I actually want to use what just happened in Eve's practice where all these thoughts were coming. Oh, I should say this when I talk, I need to say that. And did I get this right? And opening my eyes and looking at my bullet point and all of that cognition happening while Eve is inviting us to just notice that and not react to them, not grab onto them really what was happening in my experience was this trusting of the natural intelligence that is flowing through me um, rather than trying to compensate with some cognitive intelligence here. So really that, that practice, this third foundation of mindfulness, being aware of our thoughts without becoming cognitively fused with them, at least in the practice, is what creates this spaciousness for us to trust, this spaciousness for um, this non-cognitive intelligence to flow. And what happens when that flows through? What happens when this natural intelligence is flowing through us? Many of you that have sat with me before have heard me talk about the importance of our own personal dharma so that when we are able to create this space, 
we're creating our own dharma, our own experience, our own path. And I'm moving into a place with my own practice, even I were just sharing a little bit about this, of that I'm finding it much more enriching to practice my own dharma incorrectly than practicing another man's dharma correctly and being perfect. Uh, where creating this spaciousness that I've been referring to, allowing this natural intelligence, that is my own dharma, that is my own lived experience. And so I think that we can take the wisdom from the dharma, we can take other people's experiences as tools, as markers, as guidance along the path. But as many of you have heard this quote before, the territory um, is not the map. So the Dharma is the map, it's not the territory. Our own experience, our own natural intelligence is the territory uh, that we wanna be engaged with, that we wanna be connected to, that allows us to trust, that allows us to come into a way of being in the world where we're not caught in ego, we're not caught in our thoughts, we're not caught in competition over analysis that we're trusting our own ability our own buddha nature our own natural intelligence our own dharma to best serve us and with this foundation of ethics that in turn allows us to best serve others so um with that i'd like to pass over to eve to kind of um, share her experience with this, with this slogan of the two witnesses holding the principal one and, and how natural intelligence can help support us through that. Hmm. Thank you, Teg. It's, um, it's such an outrageous invitation. It really is, you know, to truly trust ourselves as the arbiter of judgment right, that we are the ones who should decide. And it's interesting, you know, I've read a number of different analyses of specifically this slogan, and what are we judging? Why do we need witnesses? What, what is it actually about? Um, and in some cases, teachers say that it's our, how are we judging our practice, our progression on this path together, right? So who do we need to tell us that we are actually doing well, that we are progressing. And it's interesting, you know, I, I actually heard a quote um, that's attributed to Goenka, I'm not sure if it's true, which says, whoever you live with is your teacher. Um, and I think also, you know, whoever you live with is your witness. Um, so should we ask our partner or our pet, how far along are we on our path? Are they gonna be the one who knows? And I think for some of us who do live with others, that's a, a harrowing prospect, <laughs> right? Oh, wow, gosh, they definitely, they know me better. And yeah, they probably see me better. Gosh, I have to do better in their eyes. And so we end up kind of creating a version of ourself, which is the one that we want to be seen, the one that we want to be appreciated. And it's, you know, it's almost like doing this extra gymnastic contortion instead of really having a sense of, Maybe actually I know, maybe I know best. I really struggle with this because truly the essence of this slogan is trust. And Tig and I were speaking about that and I like the idea of trust, but it's, um, it's opposite or it's kind of um, maybe the darker side of it is doubt. And I'm way more comfortable with doubt. Doubt feels really safe to me. Because with doubt, there can be many options still open. Well, I'm not sure about that. Maybe that, I don't know. Yeah, like what is, what is going to be good for my practice? You know, actually, I think practicing at night is good for me. Well, maybe in the morning. Actually, maybe I just stop practicing and start writing. Or maybe I'll do music or dance, right? This kind of ongoing lack of landing anywhere. Or even worse, doubt of really feeling actually, I think I'm not very good, especially when I compare myself to Tig. God, I don't think I'm really doing well at all. I'm not really um, 
able to have a sense of my own dharma. I, I need other people's dharma, right? So doubt can also have that flavor of doubting ourselves. And it's not as though we earn trust. Like, okay, once I demonstrate that I can practice every day for three months, then I'll deserve trust to decide whether or not I'm a good practitioner. It's a natural trust. It's our birthright. It's that we already intrinsically have a sense of deep inner knowing, that we have the capacity to refine and cultivate this introspection to know ourselves. And the entire practice is that. And if we don't get snagged up <laughs> with judging it too harshly, we are already doing a good job. So whatever occurred in your proliferation of thoughts, memories, images, and other mental formations in that first practice, it's a really good, you know, set of um, kind of illustrations of, of what's going on, what's happening for you. If we want to get closer, if we want to observe or witness ourselves, we can just look, we can just observe, we can just reflect on ourselves. I think it's nice to, um, I mean, this idea of non-cognitive knowing, it's just so in opposition to most of what all of us have been taught and most of what all of us are on a day-to-day -day reinforcing. A non-cognitive knowing, like, what does that mean? You mean I don't think about it? Well, then what is it? And so there's a real invitation here to cultivate a sense of feeling into. And as I mentioned in the very beginning of our time together, just discussing this idea of intuitive knowing for me was enough to kind of soften and make porous this internal, um, I would say like a bridge inward to really know myself. And I was astounded to have some real wisdom just arise, some real sense of what's good for me, what might be a great decision for my life, for my work. And it definitely wasn't, I think I should do this. It was a knowing. Does that sound familiar to you all? Have you had that knowing kind of show up at least occasionally? And so it's interesting that, you know, we think about this intuitive or internal knowing, you know, and of the two witnesses, you know, really take the one. It in some ways points out one, one teacher, Judy Leaf, who has just written so much on the Lojong slogans and so beautifully, she says, in this slogan, we're kind of forced to really recognize aloneness and recognize confidence. And for most of us, we would really like to have a sense of community and connection and, and being a part of and with others, and that's beautiful. But, or and, yeah, we come into this world alone and we do leave this world alone. And that's not meant to be morbid and sad, but why would we look towards anyone else to show us about our practice if that's where we're going to need our practice the most as we leave, right? And it's going to be us. If we're fortunate, we'll have loved ones or maybe even a teacher with us. But this idea that we are cultivating our own hearts and minds, preparing ourselves for all of life's adversities and then sickness old age, and dying if we're lucky enough to go to old age. So I think this practice can really actually go to a place that's, that's quite deep of understanding and recognizing the aloneness, the deep aloneness that is part of our humanity. And that that's trustworthy. That's not a state we're trying to overcome or get rid of. But there's a real wisdom and recognizing that aloneness. And it's why, you know, some of us do seek this time every day or every week to be completely inward. Maybe we use guidance from a teacher, but you know, that, that territory that Tig was pointing out, that inner territory of our Dharma, our experience. It's so beautiful. I think, you know, an example for me in thinking of, well, what is this like on a day-to-day -day basis? What is this like to feel into a sense of trust for, for myself, for my practice, for my, for my progress on the path? 
uh, big air quotes there. And, you know, I think of the cultivation of generosity. The cultivation of generosity, I, I do think is a really beautiful indicator of our progress on the path. And, you know, I think, I think about the generosity that I, um, I offer that feels very free with friends and, and family. And I can see a sense of like doubt occasionally, like, hmm, is this the generosity of real generosity or is there some expectation still there, right? So this practice actually acts, asks us once again to cut through self-deception, really see clearly. And then sometimes I wonder, is this generosity? Because I know generosity is a paramita and I definitely know it's a good quality. So I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm doing it out of striving. Am I fooling myself? And there can be a little bit of interesting introspection there. And then I will notice right in the middle of my generosity, this is trustworthy. I didn't preconceive this. I am definitely not expecting anything out of it. I am embodying this. It is coming through me. That's such a wonderful feeling. And that sense of, you know, this was, no one even needs to, no one needs to witness it. Maybe my generosity is, I don't know why, maybe someone on this call does, seems that like these little silverfish bugs, they love sinks in San Francisco. We noticed it, they're like this big. And I'm like a one person silverfish bug rescue. And um, I used to really, you know, um, not like bugs. <laughs> and having seen so many beautiful teachers over the years just make, oh, just, you know, like literally stop a meditation class to usher out a tiny little being into the hallway. And I think probably the first time or two, I thought it was annoying or they're doing it for show. But then I noticed just the gentleness and kindness of that act of truly treasuring all beings and in that moment, really acting it. And now here I am, one person silverfish rescue out of my own sink. No one's watching, right? I'm not doing it for a class. Now I'm doing it for class. I just ruined it. But I really, that wasn't the original intention. Then I just feel like such a sense of I'm doing it for the right reasons. And I think that gets us towards this cultivation of a sense of deep kind of um, intuitive knowing. Yeah, really being able to trust ourselves. And, you know, I think one thing we were hoping to, you know, engage with you all tonight in general questions you have about this practice, but we were hoping to have you really reflect on two questions with us. And as we have done before, we're gonna invite you to use this incredible um, high-tech mode of interactive connection by changing your name to just human. So I'll start us off. It's the little dots right next to your name. So I going from Eve Ekman to human. And for those of you who haven't done this, this means that when we write in the chat, it's all humans. So we can do so with just a lot of openness. And our hope was to really get a sense from you all, where do you find yourself trusting yourself? And what does that feel like? So just taking a couple moments, where do I trust myself? And what does it feel like?
I see caring for my body, cooking, dynamic satisfaction and fun with my reverence for nature and setting my intention. Sometimes I have to be patient before I know what I'm really feeling. If I wait long enough, I can usually trust myself. The long-term unfolding of life's journey. Whew. I bow down to that one. <laughs> Engaging with pets. I was going to say the same thing. I trust myself with my cat. <sighs> to know my boundaries feels safe. Allowing rest. Another human here says, more so with work and advocacy than personal relationships. I work a lot on social justice to shift power dynamics. I feel like there are broader values than our community, than our community driven that guide my work and help me trust certain decisions or know who to reach out to if I need to reflect. Wow, that is powerful. Yeah. In trauma therapy, trusting my brain to bring up the right memories and make the right connections to be able to heal. How I love the world, tender and open. My heart quivers when I see and trust myself and my love for my children despite being lonely for them. Protecting my energy making friends and noticing who I like myself with. Hmm. Yoga practice, letting the body do what it needs. When I listen. Hmm. When the pain of others quivers my heart and I help. Quite moving to, to hear of this. Um, ways we already trust ourselves. Yeah. Um, when I make art, whew, also I bow to that one. That is a beautiful practice. I'd love to hear from folks, um, yeah, questions or reflections on this slogan. Whoever wrote when I take a nap, I, I, I totally agree. That is, that should be a more, should be instituted into all workplaces. Hmm. If someone has a question, they are welcome to raise their hand or just unmute or write in the chat. Um, Tig, I'm curious, anything come up for you in reading these from folks? I, I'm visualizing this whole chat box as like a garden blooming with flowers, you know, like everything that you're, everyone, <clears throat> excuse me, everything that everyone is sharing is this natural intelligence of knowing when to open without thinking about it. So mm. it's just really beautiful to kind of see it in terms of that analogy and, and all this beauty that's coming forth into the world. And uh, yeah, mm. and there, you know, a lot of these are really bringing true for me as well, especially this last one, when I dance, there's a, a natural, um, in my own experience dancing, there's like this natural energy that takes over as long as I can get out of my head mm -hmm. uh, and that, you know, so I appreciate that. Hmm. Aha. Oh yes. When you wake up in the night, ruminating about things you've already sorted through, what do you do? <sighs> yes. It's such a huge question. Um, I struggle uh, sometimes with sleeplessness, especially when there are um, a lot of things going on in, in relative reality. There's a number of instructions that have been given to me. And then I'd be curious <laughs> what TIG has tried or heard. Um, the one that I have found the most useful for myself is not just focusing on the breath, because almost always you're told to focus on the breath or one way or the other, but to really focus on the breath at the belly. 
and that this grounding experience of the belly uh, gives you just enough to focus on that you're not um, just getting re-caught up in rumination, um, but it also isn't so specific that it kind of like further agitates and excites you. So I do find that one helpful. I actually got some really interesting instruction that I've also used. Um, I, I feel a little humble sharing it because it is not my teaching. So it's a teaching by someone named Robert Svoboda, who actually uh, Chandra's partner studies with, he's an Ayurvedic doctor. And I was really struggling on a retreat um, that he was co-leading with Chandra and her partner to sleep because they were doing these breath practices and it elevated all my energy. So it wasn't negative rumination. It wasn't, you know, worry and stress. It was literally just this vital energy of practice. And he recommended I start um, visualizing and dissolving from my feet all the way up to my head. I've never made it all the way to my head. So there's something about that kind of dissolving of form that worked for me. Again, those were the instructions he gave me. He is a far more qualified teacher to do so, but I don't think it can harm you to try it. Worst case scenario, it doesn't work. Um, you know, and I do think for me in the night, there's also, I have to have a, like a, a compassion slogan. And whether that's, it's okay, or I love you, or you are already safe. You are already safe has worked pretty well for me because often what I find is ruminations are our mind's vigilance from the day, not being able to unwind. And, you know, mostly as humans, we wanna be safe. So what's that kind of one cutting through phrase that we can kind of tell ourselves in that comforting way? Yeah. Take any other tricks for us? I find it so prevalent. Well, just picking up where you left off, I, you know, my compassionate phrase is, it makes sense. It's mm. always my go-to compassion. It makes sense that I'm feeling this way. It makes sense that I'm that this, there's these ruminating thoughts. Uh, for me, I find it very helpful uh, to get up and write down the thoughts. So it becomes, it, it, I, it becomes external to me. It's not something that I'm holding inside anymore. It makes it I can see them, I can, you know, it, it just makes it a little bit more easier for me to relate to the thoughts and just let them, let them move. Um, sometimes stream of consciousness writing in that moment really works just as a short practice. And then I go to breath and building on what Eve offered about bringing the awareness down to the belly. I also do more than just mindfulness of breath. I go into a diaphragmatic breathing, uh, especially if, if I'm already laying down on the bed um, if I'm laying on my belly, pushing the belly down into the mattress while I'm breathing in, uh, or if I'm laying on my back, extending the belly up towards the ceiling as I breathe in. So it's not just about mindful awareness of the breath, but you're actually giving the mind something to do mm -hmm. uh, in manipulating it. Uh, generally will um, take care of getting, you know, get the thoughts out on paper and then bring the awareness down into the body. Um, and we also know just from a biological perspective what that diaphragmatic breath is doing in terms of the balance in the body and the calming the nervous system and easing the signals that are traveling on the vagus nerve. So mm. they're my two go-tos. I also think, you know, our, our mind that wakes up in the night is not that different than our mind during the day. And so to practice during the day with, you know, busyness and agitation, so just stopping and whatever, all the thoughts that are probably running in between what we've just been doing on our way to what we're doing next, can you practice at that moment, the kind of settling that you would like to experience at night? So kind of developing that capacity and ability in the middle of the day, towards the end of the day. And so that it's kind of familiar and it's not trying to do this pretty hard thing, which is turn off or at least reduce the volume on your thoughts. There's been a little lead up practice to that. Wonderful. Someone says the slogan brings me home and I relax into who I am. Yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful to hear. And I think 
you know, I was again sharing with Tig when we were talking about the slogan is in a lot of the fields of positive psychology, we inadvertently get this idea that maybe, you know, we are entirely social um, and that it is more important for us to have a, a sense of social intelligence even than maybe our own sense of inner intelligence. And I don't think we could actually be kind of fully well if we don't have some sense of our own kind of inner ecosystem, our inner ecology. I, I love the idea of bringing the natural in here. And that doesn't mean that we are not connected to everybody and that we are not dedicated to the well-being of others. So it's this interesting tension of how do we really take accountability, responsibility, and care for ourselves? The aloneness, the uniqueness of ourselves, while also deeply being dedicated to this interpersonal world we live in. Hmm. So nice to be silent together. I don't want to burst the bubble. Um, wow. Uh, but I would, I would love to invite you to take for our, when you feel ready for our second practice. Great. So, um, even that we've been talking a lot about trust and we just did this exercise on when we feel that trust, um, we're gonna move into an experiential practice of feeling into the body uh, and familiarizing ourselves with the feeling of trust. Um, and then uh, as we love to do in the Sangha, we'll begin to explore that with others uh, and then how we can offer that trust as a expression of altruism and doing good in the world. Um, so, I'd like to invite you to find a comfortable posture, whether it's seated, standing, perhaps laying down. And if it feels comfortable returning to closed eyes, if you'd rather keep them open, lowering them down to the surface in front of you. And knowing that it's later in the evening and we've had long days, it may be stimulating sleep if we close the eyes. So the invitation here to softly open the eyes to bring a sense of wakefulness into the practice if that's what's needed. And let's take a moment just to arrive into this practice, letting go of the teachings and the conversations that we've had and steadying ourselves in the breath for just a few moments of experiencing the air flowing in and out of the body. And even here, we can practice trusting that on the out breath, the next inhale will arrive. We don't have to think about it. We just naturally be present with the breath and the next one arrives. And as we begin to transition into the main part of this practice, Returning to the question of how do we trust? What aspect do we trust ourselves in our life? And perhaps it can be the answer that you shared or that you were working with in the reflection. 
or maybe there's other concepts or ideas that are popping up into your mind of where do you trust yourself? What aspects of life can you feel this natural intelligence flowing through you? And these can be big things, they can be little things. You can choose to focus on one or you can allow multiple ways that you trust yourself to arise in the mind stream. With an invitation now to imagine yourself doing this action. So imagining that you're in the process of what it is that you trust yourself with. And see yourself moving through this experience of trusting yourself. And noticing the feelings that may be arising in the somatic field and the body as we use our cognitive thought to recall this aspect of ourself that we trust, noticing the felt experience of that in the body. And perhaps if it feels comfortable, you can drop the concept, drop the thinking about how we trust ourselves and rest in the feeling that arises. And using this felt experience as the anchor for this moment And if nothing's arising in the body or it's a bit more subtle, you're more than welcome to work with either the visualization of yourself trusting or even the thought of what it's like to trust yourself. And so what we're doing here is creating a direct experience with the feeling of trust, how it feels in the body, what it looks like, sounds like. If you'd like, you can allow this feeling to begin to expand through the body, perhaps using the breath, the inhale to heighten the awareness of this feeling and then on the exhale, sending it all the way through the body. So if trusting yourself feels safe, allowing that feeling of safety to expand and ripple out through the body. If there's a sense of relief or relaxation through trusting yourself, trusting your experience, Breathing into that sense of relaxation and then breathing out and allowing it to fill the body. And don't worry so much about naming the feeling, just resting the awareness in the felt experience. If the mind wanders away to other thoughts or perhaps even doubt, just using our mindfulness practice here as a tool to notice that, notice those thoughts. Remember that we are not the thoughts, we're the awareness of them. And returning back to the felt experience of what it's like to trust ourselves. And the longer that we maintain this feeling and every time we return back to this experience after the mind wanders, we're strengthening these pathways to create the familiar experience of trusting ourselves.
Now I'd like to invite you to consider a loved one, someone that's close to you that you trust. And what it's like to be in their presence. What it's like to feel this trust of the loved one. perhaps visualizing an experience with this loved one in the mind's eye that allows you to cultivate this feeling of trust. Or maybe it's something that arises naturally just by thinking about this loved one. And again, paying attention to how this arises in the body? What is the felt experience of trusting this loved one? And again, if it's possible, dropping the cognition around this and just resting in the felt experience of being in a trusting, loving relationship. And if you are able to identify this feeling in the body, perhaps returning to breathing in, focusing the concentration on the in-breath, on this feeling, and then as you breathe out, allowing this feeling to extend once again through the body. And given that we are on the eve of giving thanks and observing our gratitude, perhaps cultivating a moment here of appreciation for this loved one, for this trust between the two of you. Maybe even silently thanking them in your mind. Perhaps setting an intention to be trustworthy of their love. And if you're holding this loved one in your mind's eye, perhaps inviting them to stay for the remainder of this practice, maybe imagining them sitting beside you now, still feeling the experience of trust. I'm taking a moment here to call to mind a teacher, a mentor, and the feelings of trust that you have for them perhaps trusting in their wisdom, trusting in their compassion, trusting in the safety that they provide for your growth. And whether you'd like to visualize the image of this teacher in front of you or just recalling a sensation of trust, beginning to sense into how it feels in the body to trust this teacher. And you may keep coming back to the same feeling in the body for self, for loved one, for teacher, or perhaps it's slightly different for each of these benefactors. Just taking a moment here to rest in the felt experience of what it's like to trust this mentor. Again, taking a moment here to pause and offer a sense of appreciation, gratitude for this teacher, for this trust between the two of you. Perhaps silently thanking them in your mind's eye. And then inviting this teacher to remain with you through the remainder of this practice, perhaps sitting on the opposite side of you now. And just taking a moment here to imagine what a world would be like where all beings trust themselves, 
what would that look like if we all trusted ourselves? And what would it be like if we all trusted each other? And again, noticing if there's skepticism or doubt or cognitive thoughts flooding your awareness. And as much as possible, returning again and again to this vision, almost this aspiration of what it would be like if our world was a trusting place. Imagining the progress that we could make transforming judgment into discernment for ourselves and each other. What the flourishing of not just humanity, but the entire planet, all beings here would look like. Perhaps taking a moment to breathe into that feeling in the body. And this time on the out breath, extending that feeling out into the world. and creating an aspiration that in trusting ourselves, learning to trust ourselves, that we can contribute to this garden of blooming flowers with this natural intelligence of knowing when to open. That cultivating this trust within ourself is doing the work to bring this world of trust and peace into fruition. we can be a part of that vision for a world of peace and compassion. And so let's take a moment to join together with everyone here in this gathering, all those that are practicing around the world right now, becoming this beautiful garden of flowers blooming across the planet. And I'd like to offer this short poem, this quote from Thich Nhat Hanh. Trust that you have a good and compassionate nature. You are part of the universe. You are made of stars. When you look at your loved one, you see they are also made of stars and carry eternity inside themselves. Looking in this way, we naturally feel reverence. And so with that deep respect of reverence, naturally we can feel a sense of gratitude. Gratitude for this practice, gratitude for this time together, gratitude for the invitation to begin to trust and open to this natural intelligence that's running through us. And so let's conclude our session tonight by dedicating the energy that we've been cultivating through exploring the slogan, through these teachings and these practices of awareness and heart opening to the flourishing of trust in the world. And in doing so, may we be the cause the condition of others' trust, of others' peace and happiness. And as we come to an end of this practice, following one more breath all the way into the body, and on the exhale, releasing the air, releasing this practice, and taking your time to return back to open eyes if you've had them close and awareness of light and each other. So thank you all for your presence and your practice tonight. Thank you, Eve. 
Thank you to the Dharma Collective for the support of bringing this into the world. Mm, that was so powerful. Quite a journey. Take, thank you. Really, yeah. <laughs> I, I was surprised what it felt like to trust myself. It felt like this very beautiful and natural experience. Mm. Mm. And yet wanting to trust the world felt so tender. Yeah. Thank you all for full, showing up so fully tonight and sharing your time with us. And yeah, really, really hope this invites some further investigation into trust and to ourselves and that deep inner knowing and what's good for us. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you all so much. We even, we in, even finished early just to make up for those extra minutes. Sometimes we go over. <laughs> I might come in for a minute. Come on in. To just talk about how great it is that the Sangha trusts each other to make generous contributions. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and how that works um and how we've been trustworthy in that in the sense that people have been able to contribute their time and their energy and their money to this sangha um, and we've been able to continue to come together and explore the teachings so thank you everyone for that and we put the link for um, contributing into the chat. And it'd be great if you just noted Eve and Tig um, that you were donating for. When you fill in the contribution form, there's a yeah. spot where you put in the teacher's name and that helps people who do the administrative activities to distribute the contribution with ease and joy. <laughs> they usually have joy, but sometimes the ease is, you know. <laughs> extra thanks to tig since he is three hours ahead of us so grateful that you um yeah bring us into your um into your concern and, and uh, concern and consideration enough that um we're, you, we get to practice with you if it was three hours from now and we were just starting like, wow, or sorry, just ending. That's yeah. Respect that. Also much love to all the Sangha kitties. Thank you. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> Truly the best part about online Dharma is just the kitties. That's... Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much for a very powerful practice. Take mm -hmm. care, everybody. Bye. Thanks. Everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Night. See you next time. <laughs>